Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello and welcome to episode 17. My guest today is Melinda Nakagawa, a scientist and nature journal teacher who brings so much warmth and genuine kindness to her work and interactions with others. Melinda currently runs nature journaling classes and a nature journal club online. Our conversation touches on many things but includes the way that she has been able to create and nurture connections with people online and across the world during the current global crisis. I know you're going to love Melinda as much as I do. Let's listen to this heart opening conversation. Melinda, thank you so much for being here with me on the podcast. You and I have connected recently, fairly recently, and I just felt like you were a soulmate, you know, a kindred spirit, and I'm so happy to talk to you here on on the podcast. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so thrilled to be here and have a conversation about nature journaling with you. (laughs) I'm interested to know about your early nature experiences, about what nature was like for you in your childhood. Um, In my childhood, I grew up on a nursery. So my parents were flower farmers. And so I played outside a lot of the time, digging up toads in the ground and climbing trees and pulling flowers apart to understand how they were made of inside. Um, and I and I just played a lot with plants because my family, were, you know, they were flower growers. And also um, my aunt and my mom were Japanese um, flower. Well, my aunt taught Japanese flower arranging. Ikebana is what it's called. Mm. And so that was kind of entrenched in our whole family. We all we all did that. And so as a little kid, I started understanding plants and flowers um, and how they, um, you know, how they interact once you've cut them and how to arrange them um, to show their individual beauty. And um, it just was part of my life. You know, plants and, and flowers were just second nature to me. Wow. I love that story. And it shows that you've been paying attention yeah. from the very beginning. Yes, yeah. Yeah, actually one of my early memories, we grew carnations, and um, one of my early memories is sitting underneath the workbench in the barn where my, where my family worked, and they would drop the like the, um, the flowers that were not, you know, the perfect ones that they were putting into bunch of growers bunches and they would be on the ground. And as a little kid, I remember kind of squatting down and peeling the flowers apart and looking at how the petals were attached inside and, you know, all the little parts and smelling the sweet nectar and, um, the sensations of the, the leaves. And I loved to draw when I was a kid and I could draw, I could draw carnations really well because, because I just realized this now because I spent so much time looking at it inside and out all over the surface of, of the flower and um, drawing just, you know, art was just a really joyful thing for me as a, as a kid. You've been a nature journaler from the yeah, beginning. I guess so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hadn't noticed that. <laughs> I'm interested now to talk about What happened when you entered adulthood and then you decided you, so you have a history of marine biology. Yes, I do. I do. But I was not always, um, I would say in nature. So as a child, I remember being in nature, climbing, playing, being outdoors, but I think around adolescence, something shifted and it's probably kind of a natural progression of, um, becoming a teenager where I gravitated towards the the peer group you know and Mm -hmm. less time in nature and that was not where I spent my time anymore and it I I think I started to get farther and farther away from nature Um, even though my parents still grew flowers my dad was a landscape gardener um, I just didn't want to get dirty I just didn't want to be you know touching those things which is kind of sad but I think I needed that kind of stepping away Mm -hmm. and um 
um, you know, I came back to nature. Um, I took over a family business and I took over a flower shop. So it was an established family business that I ran for about 10 years as the owner and operator and lead designer and, you know, everything with wow. my family. And um, during that time is, gosh, a number of things came together. Um, one is my re reintroduction to nature, perhaps. Um, and then I'll get to the marine biology part. But I met someone when I was 21 um, who grew up going on hikes and camping and being in nature with his family. And I didn't do that kind of activity with my folks. My folks were always working. And he and I would go to these local um, parks and go for hikes in the, mount in the mountains or the woods in the Bay Area. And I remember this one hike we went on we heard some scratching on the, um, up ahead of us on the trail underneath the bushes. And, you know, he said, oh, that's a rufous-sided towhee. And I said, that's a what? You know, and, and then he like, you know, we leaned. I remember us leaning forward and trying to look through the branches. And we saw this um, large sparrow that was scratching in the leaves looking for food. And I saw it had this beautiful rust-colored side and black and white and and. I'm not sure if I saw the red eye then, but it has a red eye and it has a different name now, but back then it was called the Rufus sided Tohi. And I thought that was the weirdest name and the most <laughs> lovely bird. And from the, I will pinpoint that moment when I started to see birds. Wow. Um, I had grown up in a nursery and birds were always around, but nobody taught me anything about them. Nobody showed me how to look at them. And it was in that moment that I realized like there's this, whole world of birds and from then on I, it was like um that that desire to know more spread like wildfire we got a, i bought a pair of binoculars i bought my first bird book and he and i went bird watching he showed me what he knew about the local birds and pretty quickly it be, i became really knowledgeable about um the birds and learned how to identify birds on, on our own and just became passionate about it. And um, my first nature journal entries are about the birds that I saw um, in our walks. Um, so I, I really, you know, pinpoint someone taking my hand and going out into nature and sharing their knowledge to help me see nature in a different way, change the trajectory of my life. Mm. Um, at the time, I didn't know what to do for a career. I had taken over the family business, um, and it wasn't really what was in my heart. And, um, you know, pretty soon afterwards, I was just so curious about nature that I, you know, took class, night classes and lectures and, you know, volunteered on the weekends with the local um, wildlife rescue, anything to get me closer to nature. And from then, I volunteered at the Marine Mammal Center um, up north of San Francisco. I live in California. And um, from there, that's when, like, my love of marine animals just started to blossom. And I really wanted to know more about the seals and sea lions that, that lived in the wild. Um, and so I just, you know, decided I'm going back to school and, you know, took all the prerequisite classes in the local um, community college. And... Um, went back to college, you know, so that I can study marine biology. And, you know, that led to a graduate degree and just really um, learned so much along the process, you know, of learning more deeply to look through a scientist's lens. Like, I think mm -hmm. that I was always really very curious. And my early experiences taught me how to notice things um, in nature and then getting the scientific training of how do I use that as a scientist, um, you know, really helped me develop even further and actually going parallel to it, um, with nature journaling in my science class, we had to keep lab notebooks. And so we did detailed drawings yes. of dissections. And I loved that part of class, you know, being able to draw something realistically and show all the detail and all the different parts. And so, that comes into um, my nature journaling, you know, later, like the things that I learned along the way. Mm. So that experience of being taken outside to nature with somebody that I trusted um, showed me that one person can change another person's life. Um, at the time, I didn't know that biology was what 
I would end up loving and, and studying. And I think from, from that moment, um, I realized maybe not at that moment, but later on, I realized that what I want to do is I want to do that for others. Mm. I want to be the guide to help you get closer to nature so that you can explore and discover that connection for yourself. That makes me feel really emotional because it's <laughs> such a powerful thing and so maybe sometimes we don't realize that we're going to just alter the course of someone's life in a positive way just by saying there's a rufus sided toe here. It was that the, <laughs> was that the name? It was, yeah. Yeah, and your husband has done that for you and yeah. – without knowing maybe on on just a simple hike together yeah and and it reminds me of a video that uh, John Muir has put out around the time of International Nature Journaling Week and he was saying in it about how we can all be mentors mm -hmm. and how even if you're just beginning you can be a mentor for someone else and you're going to support them in a journey that's that's going to change them in a positive, beautiful way and mm. and that we can do that for each other no matter what point we are on the nature journaling journey mm -hmm. is a beautiful, beautiful thing and that your story reminds me of that. Yeah, yeah. And if the word mentor or, you know, it feels a little bit big and mm. uncomfortable to, to take on, <laughs> you know, just share what you love. Yeah. Just, just share what what stirs that that spark of joy in your heart when you're in nature? That's all you have to do. Is we don't I think we we it, we're in this society where knowledge is valued, right? Like having lots of facts and uh, measurements and numbers in our head. But you don't have to be an expert. My husband wasn't an expert about birds. He just knew that that was mm. that kind of bird and shared that information with me and his you know, excitement or happiness about seeing it yeah, and shared a little bit of the facts about the fact that, oh, these birds are on the ground and that's why they're scratching in the leaf litter. I remember learning that those facts on that trip. And, um, you know, my friends today would probably not recognize that I, at one time I didn't know what birds were in my backyard, that at one time I was afraid to sit on a log to have a picnic because I would get <laughs> dirty. Um, but that happened. That is my life experience. I played in the dirt as a kid. I stepped away from the dirt in adolescence. And as a young adult, I was brought back to nature. And, you know, today I get dirty and I get muddy. I play with kids in, you know, outside in different, in all kinds of weather. And, um, you know, later I worked on a seabird breeding colony covered with bird guano, you know, and, <laughs> and it was the most joyous experience for me. So, so that's the transformation that happened, right? Yes. Someone From who's that afraid. One simple mention exactly. Of that. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. Anyone can do this for someone else. And if this is a child that's in your life, you know, whether it's yours or um, a niece or a neighbor, neighbor child, you know, sharing something you're excited about, those are the best learning and teaching moments. And, you know, we can all do that. Ah, uh, Melinda, I've got goosebumps. <laughs> I just think it's beautiful. I think I, I love that story, but also that really powerful message that this, that we can do this for each other just by showing enthusiasm for nature. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that you did some shorebird research and I love yeah. this because you and I are connected geographically by these particular shorebirds. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to talk about that sure. a little bit? Yeah. There's a bird called, um, I think mutton bird is what, what is mm -hmm. called down in your your neck of the, the, the planet. And we call them sooty shearwaters. And they're a marine bird that... Um, I was going to say lives in New Zealand, but really spends half of the year in New Zealand during the breeding season, which is the Southern Hemisphere spring and summer. And after the end of the summer, when the, the chicks that they've raised are, have left the nest, the adults um, will fly, actually, you know, the, the birds that are able to fly will fly north from the Southern Hemisphere across the Pacific Ocean, diagonally to the U.S. West Coast and spend the northern spring and summer so basically they are in in eternal spring and summer they never 
spend anywhere in winter, which is a pretty amazing uh, nice vacation. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I love that. I mean, it's such an epic migration, isn't it? From yeah, from all the way down this end of the world to it to is. where you are. It is. So they help connect the Earth, right, um, from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere, and. Um, you know, I studied them for my graduate work, and it was just so incredible to know that such a small bird, they're about the size of a gull, um, and they make this incredible migration thousands and thousands of miles pretty much nonstop, you know, because there's nowhere to, to stop, really. Yes, yes. Um, and yeah. Yeah, so they're, I they're love pretty it. incredible. Mm -hmm. When you told me that, I felt really nice, like, oh, you're connected to, uh, yeah. to us by the birds. It's really yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, we're developing this whole new way of interacting. Like, we're developing a, a nature journal community that is worldwide and through yeah. the internet and everything's changed, especially this year. And so you have this history of marine biology, a, a scientist, and now you're a full-time nature journal teacher and you do yep. this mostly at the moment online. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that transition, how it's come to be? Yeah. Um, gosh, well, before March 11th, I think it was March 11th of 2020, early this year, I was working several different jobs and it was all nature connected. It was a, you know, nature connection mentor. I worked with um, preschool age children to elementary and also taught um, adults over 50. And um, those were all in person. Um, you know, it was also a naturalist guide and, you know, I did things that I really enjoyed, but they were really active in all kinds of, you know, different locations. Um, and when March hit, um, I, those jobs stopped. And so there was no income. And I recognized that there's a lot of people in the same situation. And I thought, what can I do to bring me joy and to share something like me sharing something to be of service to the community. And I had recently started a nature journal club um, in my area in a few months earlier in October of 2019. And we were meeting in person twice a month. And so I thought, well, let's just get the Nature Journal Club together and we'll do it on Zoom because I had yes. familiar, you know, I'd used Zoom before. And it just was, you know, I started my first Zoom session with Nature Journaling. We, I invited the people that were on my mailing list. Um, I shared some something about how can we Nature Journal, a prompt. Then we logged off and went to our nearby nature and everyone journaled something and then came back and then we shared it just like Such we would if we were format. yeah just like we would if we were in person but it was different um and there were a lot of things that i tested and and kind of refined and worked out but um but I've been doing that every week on Sunday mornings, um, Pacific time. And it has been such a joy. It is an international group. I have people that would n never be able to come in person, but that come regularly because it's online. Yes. And I like to say that, um, yeah, it is another way to, it is another time of your day that you have to be online. But the purpose of this online time is to inspire and motivate you to get outside. Yes to give you the tools and the practice and to come back and share it so that you can reinforce it and inspire each other and keep it going. So I think in that way, the format has been working really beautifully to inspire others um, to see nature in a different way. I love that, you know, there's nature journal clubs all around, but they can't, a lot of them can't meet at the moment. And so there's a bit more of a network happening in that, like you say, people are coming to the Nature Journal Club that that geographically couldn't couldn't make it right. in the past. Yes, if it, if it wasn't online. Yeah, and it also connects us as a community um, because you know we have people in um, that come regularly from London and Sweden, um, from the southern hemisphere, uh, from the southern hemisphere as well, out, out to Alaska in the northern hemisphere, and so during this time online, we're connecting globally. Like, mm. like I'm looking at these people on the screen, and we're all all around the world, and yet we're all focused with the same intention on one thing, 
And that, like, I envision in my mind, like, how powerful that is. Like, we're these, like, little points of light spread around the globe. And we are connected through the indivisible, indivisible lines of the internet, right, connecting us. And that's, you know, that's really inspiring to see mm. that um, we can all do this. That there's such a great way that we can create connection using this technology. Um, and, you know, the internet and computers, it's just a tool. Right. Mm. So it could be used to waste your time scrolling all day or it could be used <laughs> to um, learn something and to connect and inspire us to do something away from the screen. Mm. Like a jumping off point. So the the gathering together online is a jumping off point to go outside and see what we can see in real in real time, in real life. It seems to me like nature journaling is just exploding in a way that it hasn't before and I wonder about your thoughts on that about do you think COVID and maybe like because everyone's online a whole lot more than they were before people are working from home kids are studying solely online I wonder if you feel like the the boom that's happening in nature journaling at the moment is in a, in response to to this techno overload or something uh, I'll say that because so many people are online and they're getting more used to being online. There, there were a lot of holdouts, right? People are like, I'm not going on Zoom at all, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first month, the second month, but now it's been going <laughs> on for a while. I'm seeing new people coming on to Zoom and mm -hmm. they're just, you know, kind of late to the game, but they're still gravitating towards it. And this is um, an opportunity for people to learn something in a way that wasn't possible. And it's also, I, I really feel strongly that, you know, nature is this counterbalance to the overloaded feeling that we get with all of the mm. technology mm. Um, for everyone, adults and for children, children especially. Um, and so if we use nature journaling as an activity to have a step outside away from the computer, it's not only... A 30 minutes let's say it's 30 minutes let it's not just 30 minutes away from the computer it is 30 minutes of replenishment yeah i think right so yes. it's more powerful than the actual time of journaling because what it's doing is it is um kind of i think of it as um like filling your cup so to speak or replenishing yes. your reserves so that when you come back to your computer to work or to go to school you are um you have a little bit more creative creative juice, a little bit more rested feeling, um, maybe feeling a little bit better, you know, um, so that you can concentrate better. Um, so yeah, I think that nature journaling is, I don't know exactly why it's so popular with everybody. Um, but I know that it's more accessible. Yes, more accessible. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, on, online. And although we're not able to gather in person, I think what this is doing is giving people skills um, so that when it's time that, to go back, that they have a little bit under their belt. I have, I just want to share one student I have shared with me. Um, she was one of the first, she was one of the first meetings that I had in March. Um, she joined and then she joined one of my nature journaling cl introductory classes. And um, she's taken all three classes. And she said that had she not done nature journaling online, she would not have the courage to go to an in-person nature journaling mm. session. And she lives in a different state than I am. So she wouldn't come to mine in person. So I think that through the internet, we can give people the practice and the confidence and the courage, right? So that they can embark on their own little nature journaling pods when we're ready to go in person. So that's just another gift of, mm. um, you know, the online format. That's so interesting. I'd love to circle back around because you mentioned a little bit about keeping um uh, scientific notebooks when you were yeah. studying as a scientist and then also that your first nature your first nature journal entries were about birds and I'd love to talk about the beginnings of your development into a nature journal and also about how because you I know you've been doing this for a really long time alone and then fairly recently you found John Muir Laws and the community of nature journalists. And I'd love to talk about that, your development into nature journaling and then also how doing it 
alone for yourself is different from doing it in community with others. Yeah. Um, back in 1998, I, um, I think the very first entry was from a whale watching trip. I went on a whale watching trip and I came back. I used to keep like notes in different places, but this day was the first time I put it in a, a notebook, a spiral bound notebook. And I have a list of the marine mammals that we saw and maybe a sentence or two about each entry. And as I started to keep more notes about it, I thought, huh, this is like, this is like a nature journal. And so I called it my nature journal and I decorated the cover and put stickers on it. And um, then that was my little notebook that I went to to write anything about nature. And that's the very beginning. And most of it, if you look through the first journal, is um, it has the, the name of the thing I saw and the circumstances under which I saw it. Like, you know, it mm -hmm. was in a group or I'm surprised about it. So it was kind of like I was already noticing things about nature and recording how many I saw. And I always had the date and the location. So in that respect, that's a nature journal entry. I just didn't have a lot of the drawing component. Mm -hmm. Um I had, I had kind of lost my courage to draw. I don't know what happened, but um, it may have just been I was just had not practiced drawing birds or marine mammals. And so the, the drawings that I drew looked very childlike and was very frustrating. And so I just didn't draw them. And there was a period of time in my journals where I would take photographs and put the photographs in there and journal around the photographs because yes, yes. I just couldn't, I, I didn't have the guidance, right, to, to draw them. I didn't know where to go. The books were hard to learn from. Um, but I think when it came to, I know there was another thing that really helped was a, a tool <laughs> that was really helpful was a micron pen. Mm -hmm. So I got this really fine pointed pen and then I was able to put lots of detail. I was using ballpoint pen before that. So imagine going from a ballpoint pen to um, a fine, fine pointed pen. Um, I remembered, um, I think I started um, biology then. And so I was drawing the insides of flowers. And so I was really curious about all the flowers in my garden. I would, you know, draw them with super detail and take a knife and cut them open. So my nature journal started to incorporate um, more botany, but, but it always had words and, you know, things that I was noticing. Measurements, lots of measurements, because that's what we learn in science, right? To be, have accurate measurements. Um, and then... I think that um, there were waves in my journaling where I stopped nature journaling because of different circumstances. Um, as a research field in field research, I kept a nature journal. It was a, in a right in the rain kind of waterproof notebook um, mm -hmm. and I would take notes in it. So um, I kept it in the field and um, continued on with that. And I think that at some point I got Claire Walker Leslie's book. I think my husband had it on his shelf and he, and he gave it to me. And it was so amazing to see this book, to see that there's other people that are recording nature. And I got a lot of ideas from what she was um, saying, showing and her scribbly messy style gave me permission to yeah. not create perfect pictures, which was such a relief because I think as a scientist, I, well, maybe it's just my nature, but also trained, trained as a scientist, I could see the detail and I couldn't, I was trapped by the detail. So if I drew a flower, I could not step away from the flower without drawing every single wrinkle mm -hmm. <laughs> or hair. And it was just so tedious and, and consuming. But when I saw in Claire Walker Leslie's books that you can just like scribble a color pencil across yeah. it for the color, it's like, wait a minute, this is totally freeing. So I then I just did a lot of color pencil and um, pencil drawings and still afraid of watercolor because I just didn't know how to use it. You know, I, I used acrylic paint and I approached watercolor in the same way and I didn't take classes. So, you know, it just was kind of stuck. Um, but then I'll, I'll fast forward to, I got John Muir Laws's, um, it's the, it's the handbook. It's called Nature Drawing, Nature Drawing, Nature Drawing. Law's Guide to Nature Drawing in general. <laughs> exactly. A friend of mine who is an artist had that book and I flipped through it and I told my husband, I said, I want this for my birthday. <laughs> and so he got it for me a few years ago. And I think it was just a really beautiful book that I looked through. I didn't really use it. Something about the book was just so beautiful to look through. And 
it was hard for me to break into any of the lessons. I, I don't know why, but that's my personal story. Um, later, I stumbled on John Muir Laws's um, videos and saw that he had a calendar of events and it was a little far for me to go to. So I watched some of the videos and it was so lovely to see the way that he taught um, and the different topics that he went over. And um, I think that's when I started to think about my nature journal in a different way and started adding different components to it. But really what what is the point of just like maximum explosion of my nature journaling? Like the shift, <laughs> the big shift was Wild Wonder um, 2019 mm. in person. I met John Your Laws um, at the very, the first day for the nature. It was like the educators forum or workshop. And when I heard him speak and felt his energy and um, just experienced his teaching. I was just was so moved. I felt like this is me in another body. That's, that's, <sighs> that's really like what I want to be doing. Not exactly like him, but you know, the essence of it, it's like, oh, I'm not alone and wait, this is possible. And during that um, whole whole week, I met a lot of people. There were 300 people there, and I was blown away that there were other people who were nature journalers. I had no idea that there was this world of people out there. And after that first um, class with Jack, I was so... I think he talked about at the end about how we can share nature journaling. And I was, I was sold. It was like, okay, I want to start a nature journaling club. I, I don't know how. And he took me aside and he just, he was so kind and generous with his time. And, um, you know, he talked about how I can start it and was so encouraging and really positive. And that made a huge difference to know that someone believed in me and told me that I can do this was really powerful mm. so um again the mentor thing like jack taking you aside and giving you sustained compassionate attention like yeah. he says it's it's a powerful thing that's led you on to s some amazing new developments yes and i and i think it's like you know one step at a time you know if i really believe that if the idea comes to you then you're probably meant to act on it, right? It's just, you know, needing to get past our own, um, our own blocks and stepping into that courage and saying, I'm going to do this. Cause yeah, it was scary. <laughs> it was totally scary. <laughs> like I'm not afraid of people, but I mean, you know, I much rather support someone else than to yeah. embark and put myself in front. However, because I did it, um, people fell in place. Like we need people to step out and say, I'm creating this, then more people will come and support you. Mm. It, it just will happen. And even if it's only one person who comes, like my first nature journaling club day, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's like, it's one person that hears the message that was able to make it on that particular day at that particular time to journal together. The power of sharing nature with another person is um, is incredible. I nature journaled alone for probably 20 years. And then to do it with others, it has made mm -hmm. a world of difference in the way that I see nature, in the way that my journal pages reflect the way that I observe and take in nature. Um, so, you know, finding a community wherever you are is, is really important for for fun and for um, keeping you going, whether it's online or in person. Um, you know, I just really encourage anyone who's even thinking about it, you know, just to say yes, you know. I mean, Jack has a page on, or John Muir Laws has a page on his website on how to start your own nature journal club. You can go there and take a look. That's what I did. And, um, you know, and you can do it with your own style and your own, you know, personality. I mean, there is no right or wrong to how to create this. And yeah, it will grow. There's something so powerful about that, isn't there? I was giving a workshop just this weekend and I gave the the group a prompt and they went out into the garden. It was in a community garden within the city and 
<laughs> just just to see everybody with their heads down and their pencils moving at the same time. I just I looked over at um, the co-organizer and I just had this huge smile because it was just it just brings me so much joy to see people journaling at the same time and then coming together and sharing ideas and sharing and looking at the way someone else does a page or and even tackles the same subject in such a different way. I love mm-hmm. that moment of journal sharing. Do you find that a powerful moment too? Oh yeah, that I think is um it's inspiring um each other. It's giving new ideas, new strategies and perspectives, but it's also really powerful for the person who's sharing. I find that often someone who is brand new and they'll say it's my first time sharing it's not so good or they'll say something to kind of you know just kind of minimize their Mm. their effort and when they hold up that page it blows me away there's always something more than one thing on there that is just uh, an amazing example of nature journaling through their eyes and they don't recognize it because they're new but we can share that and say yes. let them know what's going well what they've done um you know what they've noticed what they've really documented to um let them be seen mm-hmm. and let them be heard and allow them to share that story that experience with us it's so powerful so it's not just about um, like a show and tell, you know, mm-hmm. or or it's a gallery that we're going and looking at pictures. It really is much more than that. And we can do this online in a way that it's different online than in person. So in my nature journal club, in person, we would lay out our journals and then we'd all walk around, but there wasn't really any dialogue about it. Mm-hmm. Like the person who whose page it was didn't get verbal feedback from other people mm-hmm. because we're all walking around. And we're probably nervous about what someone would say, right? But I found that shifting to online and um, I'm allowing people to um, share their page with each other, then we know who the whose page it is and you can give them this like, you know, great feeling, you know, this, this validation and this, um, you know, cheering them on in a way, right? So that they know that what they've done is good. Because we're so used to being critiqued, but, you know, I really encourage all the people in my community to look for what's good in the page Mm. and not focus on what's not working, right? That's, we don't (laughs) need any more of that. Um, And the other thing online is that, um, I just remembered, you know, I do a demonstration um, of like how you can nature journal something um, for my students and for my free um, Sunday club. And that's hard to do in person. You know, if you're outside with 30 people, you're right. Yeah. It's really hard for 30 people to look over your shoulder. But mm. if you do it online, you can share your screen. And I have a document camera that shows my sketchbook in my hand, and everyone can see it. And so, in that way, it's kind of more intimate, you know, mm. like you're right there with the person who's drawing. So, um, yeah. So, there's, I think there's a lot of good stuff about an online format. It just, needs to be taught differently um, and presented differently, but it's totally possible. We've created an amazing connection and I've heard um, my students say that they feel, you know, really safe in the environment that that's been created. So we can create that. That's lovely. I'd love to speak just a little bit more about the idea of feedback because Mm -hmm. in nature journaling and especially as nature journal teachers, we're really trying to de-emphasize the idea that we're making a pretty picture and because there's so much so many like wounds within people especially adults about like I can't draw or I'm not good Mm -hmm. enough and I'm wondering what your strategy is for when you're giving feedback specifically to someone for their nature journal page how can how can others that are listening to this give feedback that that's not about the pretty picture that that encourages the person to go forward without talking about their artworks. That's an excellent question. And I think it's something that um, we can all learn. It's a skill, (laughs) just like drawing is a skill, (laughs) which means that we can learn it with practice, with intention and practice and and desire. We need to have a desire. Um, And I teach my students that, Although our first pass 
our experience with drawing may have been in an art class, that here in nature journaling, drawing is used as a learning tool. Mm. So it's not about, the purpose is not art. It is not about making a, a picture or a page that's pretty. That's not the focus of it. Although your page might end up being pretty, you know, if you keep doing this over time, but that the focus is when, and I learned this as a scientist, you know, um, drawing in my, my field notebooks, that when I'm drawing something, I'm paying very close attention to how the petal meets the, mm -hmm. you know, touches the next petal or how the stem comes off of the branch or how these feathers lay together, right? And I wouldn't notice those if I took a photograph or if I just looked at it, if, if we, you and I stood next to the flower and looked at it, we wouldn't capture that detail in our memory. But drawing allows us to slow down and really focus our attention. And that's why drawing is powerful. And then I let those know who are maybe slightly intimidated or um, apprehensive to draw that um, or and to share their page is the intention of sharing the page is not to critique each other's work, that it's really to celebrate what you experienced, mm. right? The journal page is your experience in nature. It is not a picture of the thing. So let's celebrate yes, that. Beautiful. Yeah. So in that celebration, um, as a teacher, I am looking for, and this stretches my brain. Okay. So I can tell you that I'm learning <laughs> every time I do this. The first few times it was terrifying, but you, you just keep doing it. And the, the best thing to, the best way to learn something is to teach it. Yes. <laughs> right. So, you know, I'm learning as I go. I also, um, practice a lot. I listen to other people, other teachers and watch the way they give feedback and say, oh yeah, I really like that. Or, or mm -hmm. I like the way they give feedback or, oh, I don't think I would say it that way. I'm going to say it this way. So you've got to find what feels like you. So it doesn't sound canned or artificial yes. or forced. So um, in general, I would um, just be curious, right? Just be curious about their page for the person who did the, a beautiful painting of of a bluebird, you know, I might ask, wow, you know, you really, you know, noticed all the colors in this bluebird. Like what, what else did you see? Was it with another bird or, you know, was it eating something or like, yeah, tell me about what it was doing. So if we're having a dialogue, that's how I would engage them. Um, I wouldn't say, well, you didn't put words on the page. I would just like, yeah. kind of like, you know, bring them back to that moment. Mm -hmm. Right. And say, gosh, what do you remember? It's like, well, were there other birds in the air? Did, were there any sounds, you know, and, and help them kind of come back to that. Mm. Um, and I would also just look for the excitement, like look at the page. Like you can tell if someone was really excited about something and just say, wow, like you, I just see how you noticed, like, you know, all those details about, you know, fill in the blank or, you know, um, gosh, you got to see this, you know, bird do that, that I have never seen that, or gosh, isn't that really cool? Be excited and be, be genuine though. Um, so if you can't <laughs> try to find something that really brings you excitement or joy or happiness in what you see. And I'm really, um, um, in, intentional about not commenting on any drawing techniques mm -hmm. in nature journaling. Um, I'm not a drawing teacher. I'm not, I don't have an art, I'm not an art teacher, right? I teach people how to see nature and how to draw and record what you see. And that's what I say all the time. And so because of that, I'm not here to, um, critique how you've crosshatched something or the watercolor technique or the values that you've used in your color. Um, if we were discussing that as a topic, mm -hmm. then that makes sense. But just, you know, in general for nature journal, because I want them to feel good about their effort because I also say in my class, whatever you put on the page today is perfect. Yes. That was exactly what meant to come on the page. And if you're not happy with what's there, then we put in some more practice. And each time you come back to this, it's going to look more like what you want it to look like. So it sounds like we can, as educators or nature journal guides, bring the essence of nature journaling to the actual response to someone's page. So you want to bring intentional curiosity to their yeah. work. 
oh, I wonder what you were thinking when you did this. Yeah. I remember um, just this weekend the the workshop I was talking about earlier, there was a, a girl and she went really detailed when we were zooming into an area she just went really detailed there and she found hairs on mm. on this tomato plant and she do- documented mm. them really detailed so in giving feedback we can bring intentional curiosity to what that person has put down on the page mm-hmm. absolutely because everyone as you know if we were all looking at the tomato plant if there were 10 of us, we'd all see something different in it. And so it's all perfect and beautiful. You know, someone may not have seen the hairs, but saw something else, some other quality or. Yes. Um, so I think that, you know, whatever comes through each person is, is perfect. And if they're not happy with it, you know, if, if you haven't practiced drawing very much, then, you know, just also reminding them that um, it only takes practice. Right. And maybe being guided, maybe taking some tips from someone or watching someone draw um, might be helpful, but that it does not have to be a technical drawing Mm. unless you want it to be. Right. So I think oftentimes when we think of nature journaling, we might think of a beautifully painted watercolor or a very detailed botanical illustration. And those, you know, have different purposes. And I wouldn't call them nature journaling. Um, You know, I really think that I think I define nature journaling is, you know, observing nature and recording what you see using, you know, the three languages of words Mm -hmm. and drawings and numbers and combining all of those together really makes that rich page. It inspires us to look more deeply and to see, I think what nature journaling does is it gets us outside to see things that were invisible right? The extraordinary in the ordinary objects. And to and beyond that, we begin to see not only with our minds and our eyes, but with our heart. Mm. So I really feel like my mission is to bridge nature, science, art, and heart. Mm. As a, you know, scientifically trained person, um, you know, we don't, we're not encouraged to bring our heart into our work. Um, but the nature journal is a different place. It is not just science. I can bring elements of science into deepening my observations, but this is where I can bring my heart. I don't have to keep that separate, right? The, like to see the wonder and beauty and the awe and the feelings that, that this thing evokes in you, you know, the nature journal welcomes all of that, you know, place all of that in this in this book you don't have to show your journal to anybody if you don't want to it could be private and personal um or it could be something that you share to inspire others to give an example of how someone else might approach doing a nature journal page so i just think um you know a journal can be each page can be totally different. There is no one format, right? Yes. That, that the page has to have. So it's just being open to inspiration and um, curiosity and creativity and, you know, sharing ideas um, with others. And I really think the sharing on part of a, of a class is really helpful. I, I usually call it the harvest. Um, I'll, I'll tell people, you I know, we're going to go around and harvest <laughs> something from these pages that we can use in our journals, right? So going through and saying like, what would, what, what would I like to harvest today? Cause I, I think it gives this, I don't know. I like the feeling of that, of that word, mm. you know, it comes from kind of the nature connection world where, um, you know, we're just learning how to be in nature, not just from our head, but from our whole body and from our heart. That's beautiful. I often talk about the head and the heart with people on this podcast and you've already covered it, you know, that that this document is a document of our time in nature, our time with ourselves and it's both, it's head and heart all mixed together. Yeah. And for me, it's, I know you asked this question of your, um, uh, of your interviewees. Um, and I was thinking about whether I, I journal from my heart or from my head mm. and it, it is both as you can imagine. Mm. And sometimes it's, it's, um, 
I don't want to call it a fight, but it's kind of a, um, like a, a friction, you know, mm-hmm. there by default, my mind is defaults to the head, the scientific part, if I'm not paying attention. So I journal every morning and I've gotten in the habit of recording the birds that I hear in, in my sit spot, which is my front yard or my backyard. And I also record a um, dawn chorus in which I record every bird that I hear that I can recognize and I write down the time. And so I've got into this practice of recording everything. So then the science scientist part of me is turned on. And so on a day that I'm not recording all the birds, like that's not the purpose of, I want to just look at nature and see what calls to me. The mm-hmm. little scientist mind or voice <laughs> in my head is like, oh, did you catch that bird? She goes, oh, wait, you got to do, oh, wait, no, this has to be repeatable. So you have to be consistent. You have to do this every day. Oh, wait, don't skip that one. <laughs> And so I find that there's this dialogue going on. Mm. And for me, sometimes it's an intentional turning off of the mind and just saying, it's okay. We're not recording all the birds. I'll actually say it out loud. (laughs) We're not recording all the birds right now. We're just going to sit here (laughs) in nature journal. And (laughs) um, so sometimes it's waffling back and forth. But what Mm. I really want to... um, to cultivate in my practice is more time from the heart Mm. more time where i'm listening to nature because um i think nature has a lot to teach us absolutely and our our pace is not at nature's pace like i was had a conversation with a friend technology puts us in a faster pace right so everything's quick i need i need it now i'm going to send it now we're focused on the future what are we going to get what are we ordering what are we you know what's going on and yet nature's pace is slow it's in this moment not the past or the future but it's right now what are the forces mm-hmm. acting right now and it's hard for us to nature journal and to get into nature's pace if we come to nature with this frenetic speed. So part of my practice is to sit and do a sit spot and take some breaths and just allow my eyes to wander across the landscape and see what jumps out. And that's my cue. Whatever catches my attention is the thing that wants to be nature journaled for the day. So it's, I think for me, it's about finding that practice for you. Like, where, where are you in your journey? You know, do you need a prompt so that you're, you're just kind of even just getting, you're just going to get to your nature journal and open the page. For some of us, it's hard to do that. It's hard to make that, that time. So I just do it by default every morning. And if I don't do it in the morning, mm-hmm. I, I often do don't get it done. And I'm, you know, towards the end of the day, I'm like, oh gosh, I really want a nature journal, something I better get out there right now and go and observe because it really replenishes me. It makes me feel more alive, you know, and more present and less scattered when I'm able to slow down and be with nature and um, be curious and be in wonder and awe about what's around us. It helps me center and ground, you know, Nature has so many lessons to teach us, but they're often unheard, mm-hmm. right? We're so focused with our own yes. agenda that the other day I sat with a willow tree in my next door neighbor's yard and I was noticing, um, I think it was an exercise that was um, recommended by um, another teacher from Wild Wonder. And I think it may have been um, Sarah who did the poetry and Mm -hmm. saying, you know, let's watch something in nature, write down the things that you know about it or notice about it, and then pull them together in a poem. And it just turned out this page just like really flowed and and became this beautiful poem for me. But what it was is because I slowed down to watch the that willow tree and record my notes about what I know about it, the history that I know about it, and what I'm observing. um, In a nutshell, what it was is a This willow tree taught me it's a tree that was cut off at the trunk. There's no main branches like someone was cutting it down and they stopped. And so it's just the trunk with these two nubs. And then these branches are are bursting out like um, starbursts from these two nubs of branches. And then my next door neighbor cuts them off every year. And I just think it's so sad is my first thought. And then I thought, oh, wait, this tree doesn't feel sadness. The tree is probably just you know, 
what the tree is saying to me is like, make a choice, you know, am I going to grow or am I going to mm -hmm. stop and just find a way to burst forth? That's what nature mm -hmm. does. It doesn't sit and cry and feel so sorry for itself. It finds a way to put new shoots out. And when those shoots get cut off, it will find another way to to put more out. And this tree has been doing this for many, many years. And nature does that mm -hmm. all around us. So by watching that tree, intentionally watching that tree and really noticing what was going on and with the intention to write a poem about like what the willow tree teaches me, what I was reminded of is that we all have that within us, that ability to choose to move forward, regardless of what difficult situations, what roadblocks or seeming seeming roadblocks that we can get through we are resilient that change is always happening right nothing is constant except for change and so lessons like that come through to me when i slow down to watch nature and i think that that can happen for you as well that's amazing that was a really rich insight that if we take the time to sit to breathe, to notice, we're learning lessons. We're learning lessons directly from nature that we can then take into the rest of life. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. I'm interested to, uh, I want you to talk a, a little bit about the the Nature Journal courses that you offer mm -hmm. and how people can connect with you, how people can join you in your courses. Yeah. Um, I teach um, introductory nature journaling courses. They are um, all live on Zoom. Just think that it's more um, engaging. In, it's interactive, right? And it's engaging. And I know that I learn best through someone teaching me um, rather than through a book um, mm -hmm. or well, a video could work, but I really like the um, the the live. So I've created a class that's um, six sessions um, live, and I have several different levels. And if you can't make it, they're recorded. So that's also an, another way to to see um, see the courses. And the format is, um, you know, we're learning some new. Um, foundations of nature journaling and we practice them mm -hmm. so we practice them together online and then we practice in between classes and then we share oh, on an online format so that everyone's getting a chance to see um, each other's pages and that um, and in the coming year I'm creating some some new exciting classes for people of different levels so um, you can find out more about that on my website at sparkinnature.com and the um, Sunday Nature Journal Club is um, donation based and anyone is welcome to come wherever you live, um, whatever your level. And um, you can also find that information on my website. Perfect. Perfect. Melinda, thank you so much. It's been just heart opening joy to chat with you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's been really wonderful to be able to take this um, trip down in my history to yeah. I think I just made some realizations about, you know, my, my past and how mm -hmm. nature and science and art have been intertwining all my life. So thank you. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I hope you found inspiration in Melinda's words. I loved what she said about sharing journal pages being a sort of harvest. Sharing the harvest is one of the ethics of permaculture. The idea of sharing our journal pages as a harvest conjured images in my mind of a fruitful garden that's shared in community with others. But instead of produce, we're sharing stories, ideas and inspiration. Such a beautiful idea. Please take the time to explore Melinda's website, sparkinnature.com. Her work in bridging the distance between people at this time, creating deep connections by using online platforms, is truly inspirational. Thanks so much for listening. See you next week. <music>